Good morning and welcome to our time of worship here at Heritage United Church. What a week it has been, hasn't it? My goodness, we had waited and waited for winter to arrive and my goodness, did it ever. I don't recall a snowfall like that until a, a very long time ago and uh, it was quite something, wasn't it? I know our little dogs, well, they couldn't even get out the front door when we first opened it. And it was a pleasure and a joy to watch as neighbors helped one another to clear their driveways or at least a path of it. Uh, one neighbor was out on the road with his snowblower blowing a, a, a sidewalk of sorts th of, through the snow so that folks would be able to walk even partway down the street. And I'd see him stop and go up and help a neighbor with his driveway who was struggling with the amount of snow that there had been. So we were housebound and in some ways it was a it was a winter calmness, a sense of peace, the quietness of a snowy day. So I hope you too found some joys in the, the day that we had this week. But now we are gathered here at the church and I come sharing with you some highlights from our newsletter. As always, on the first page of our newsletter is a little something that I plan to speak about and this week's uh, title is, We Belong to One Another. I look forward to sharing that message with you a little bit later in our service. Of course, there are also the scripture passages that are listed for the week uh, put out by lectionary. The, these are not all ones that I will be speaking about, but they are all the ones that are, are posted each and every week. Uh, on the second page, maybe this is, a, is a, a good one for us as we come into this time of year where we're maybe a little bit more reflective as we get a little bit more housebound because of weather. And I share with you a, 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 an adaption I made of a, of a writing called The Container of Your Heart. It's uh, from a book I have called Prayer Seeds by Joyce Rupp, who I'm sure you've heard me mention before. And I invite you to, to take the time to, to really sit with this. Uh, it's a blessing bowl, uh, an opportunity to bring our hands together and to really reflect on, on different bowls in our lives, those things that impact us. And what are we doing here at Heritage? Well, of course we're doing something. We are still working on our next soup lunch uh, at the drive-by pickup on February the 12th between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. And if you wish to make an order, you have to have your order in to us by February the 4th. And there are such great selections. I'm really looking forward to this. Sweet potato, squash with no milk and it's a vegetarian. There's a vegetable, gluten-free, cream of vegetable with coconut milk, non-dairy, vegan, and gluten-free, creamy mushroom, which of course is gluten-free, a Hungarian goulash with pasta, and Mexican chicken with corn. Those all sound wonderful. And of course, you get this with a scone and a choice of either cookies or squares. So make sure you get your orders in because uh, these soups are always a big hit. And with that, uh, I leave you with the rest to look at. I hope you will join me and others following our service today at 11 o'clock on Zoom, either by phone or by computer. It's always a great chance to catch up with each and every one of you. And so let us gather for worship. As we enter into the sacred time of worship together, I think first of the the fresh fallen snow, how quiet it is, like a blanket covering the earth, protecting and, and nurturing. May we in this time of worship too, sense the comfort that we need. May we put aside those things that consume our time so that we can feel the warmth of God's love and know that God is with us in all of our moments. As we sense God's presence with us, and we begin this time of worship, we take our candle, 
knowing that God's light guides us, comforts and protects us. And so may the light of Christ be with us in our time together this morning. Amen. We each have many gifts to offer in service to God. Some will be teachers, others preachers. Some will be capable leaders, others will be skillful workers. Some will be those who have visions of all the possibilities. Others will find ways to make these visions a reality. Some will develop ministries of peace and justice. Others will seek to change unjust systems. Each person here has been blessed by God, and so we come to listen for God's word in our lives and in our life together. To lift up those concerns that are close to our hearts, we are gathered together this morning as the body of Christ. May God find a welcome home among us. And as God finds that welcome home, let us sing together our opening hymn, Deep in Our Hearts, from More Voices, number 154. Let us sing. Let us pray together. O wondrous God, on this holy day, we have gathered together once again to celebrate your presence among us, to praise you, and to thank you for all you have given us. May this time of worship strengthen and refresh us and fill us with such joy that we cannot help but share it with everyone around us. Though we are very different people with many different talents and gifts, make us one in your spirit so that we may be your ministers in the world. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our time here on the chancel steps with all my friends. Nice to see you all, everybody. Mrs. Bonnet and hi, Peepers the Chick. Oh, there's Taz. How are you doing, Taz? I hope you're well. Of course, I've got our our new friends together with uh, with our summer bear and and our, I love these outfits and I'm glad that you've come to, to join us for this short holiday season. Of course, I've got Fair Crow and uh, I've got our guardian angel bear. I've got Jim the love bear. 
Oh, and of course I've got, oh, Betty Boop. Betty Boop is reminding us once again of our coming soup lunch. I love heart-shaped cookies. This is a great idea, Betty Boop. And of course, Moose, see you at curbside. Pick up soup curb curbside. We're looking forward to that too. I'm sure that, uh, oh, and uh, you've got flour, a sack of flour and some measuring spoons. What are you planning to make, Moose? Maybe Moose is gonna make some of those wonderful scones. What do you think? That would be great. And of course, we've got Farmer Fred with uh, his, uh, he's got some, uh, some seeds here and a spoon. It looks like he's working too to help make sure that our soup, maybe he's one of the ones stirring a pot of soup. I know that cream of mushroom will be made at his home, of course. We've got Sweater Bear and uh, Sally and Danny and Suzanne and uh, our Ed Chip. Hello back there, you guys. Nice to have you. And our, and our reminder of our first responders who, my goodness, we needed them this past week, certainly, didn't we? As uh, lots of them helped to dig us out and uh, keep people safe on the roads with our big snowstorm. And we have Joe and Lucinda. How are you both? Nice to see you. Yes, it is good to be here. And what's that? You went out and helped do some shoveling? Oh, you did as well. Yes, there was a lot of snow when I got here at the church out front. But thanks to my friends and to the, the community that does our plowing for us, I was able to get in because, my goodness, the snow banks were high. Each person helped in a different way, which sort of reminded me of what I was going to talk about today. I was thinking of the Bible. And I brought up a, a children's Bible that I've got. This is a, the Hear Me Read Bible. And it has got so many great stories of, of different people in here. Uh, like, it's got the story of uh, the birth of Moses and those that took care of him. It's got the, uh, and there, there would be baby, baby Moses. Uh, it's got the stories of uh, those that were in, in Jericho. And, oh, David and Goliath, little David and Goliath, and the strength of a young little man. It's got the story of the star that shone over Bethlehem as the, uh, as the Magi rode in to see him. And it's got the stories of, of Mary who was putting together a wonderful meal for Jesus in her home as Martha sat and listened. All sorts of different people with different gifts and talents. I wonder what kinds of gifts my friends here on the chancel steps would say that they have. Like Moose, who is getting ready to possibly roll out some scones for our soup lunch, or for Betty to make us some wonderful heart-shaped cookies. I wonder what each of my friends would be thinking would be their talent or gift to share. And what would be each of yours? Because you know what? We are all connected to the story. God has given each and every one of us special and unique gifts, some big, some small, some obvious, some not. But each and every gift that we have been given is no less important than the other. And so will you find the ways that you can this coming week to use those gifts that have been given to you? Hey, maybe it might be helping to do some baking for our upcoming soups on lunch. Have a great week, everyone. Until next time, bye-bye. As we walk in the light of Christ, we are also called to be that light. When we share in the offering, we are being the light of Christ. We offer much more than just money. We offer ourselves, our commitment, our hope, and our love. Thank you for being a light in the shadowed places of this world. May we take this moment to reflect on how each of us has given and will continue to give as our offering is received. <laughs>
Let us dedicate our offering. Let us pray. Bless us and these gifts, O God. May our sharing today be multiplied for tomorrow, opening an attitude of generosity for the world around us. Amen. And now let us take this time as we bring our prayers to God for concerns, for joys, for challenges, for those things that weigh heaviest on our minds this day, as we bring our prayers for family and friends, our community and the world around us together in prayer. Let us pray. God of all being and source of every blessing, we thank you for all good things. We thank you for how our lives were enriched this past week in tasks we accomplished, in relationships we appreciated, in questions answered. We think too of all that you provide us with, a warm place to live, food on the table, a sense of security in our roles, in our families and in our community, each memory, pleasure, source of strength, we are forever thankful. God, we pray for our world and its leaders in these challenging times. Grant to each one discernment and encourage them to always be working for peace. God, in whom we rely, hear our concerns for the world around us. We remember those whose lives are lived in the turmoil of immigration in the desperation of poverty, in the fear of illness and treatment, and in the struggles for freedom and justice, in the weariness of war, in the bleakness of despair. We pray for all people and places who are affected. Compassionate God, you know the particular concerns that we struggle with today. Oh God, as we pause, we Realize that there are so many who need your healing touch today. Some are flooded with daily stresses that affect their families. Some are anxious. Some are hopeful. Some continue to fight health concerns. Whatever our situations, you meet us as we turn to you in a moment of quiet. This moment and this time, we bring before you the names of those who we feel most concerned about this day as we pray for Bob and Alma Watt, for John Seagriff, for Bob and Marilyn Palmer, for Sharon Lee, for Brian Lee, for Ali Jones, for Richard Kimball, for Michaela Gizes, and for Lynn Connell. All of us need you and all of us reach out for your hand to guide us, your spirit to fill us, your love to embrace us. Holy One, into your hands we entrust all these prayers, those spoken aloud and those unspoken. We gather these and all our prayers to Jesus Christ who shared with us the words to pray, praying together now. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31a. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we are, we are all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed parts of the body every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If we were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem, to seem weak, weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that we should be no division in the body, and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And God has placed in the church first all the, of all the apostles, first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, of, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
now let us hear a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread to the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. God bless these readings this morning. Amen. And now let us join our voices together as we sing Loving Spirit from our Voices United hymn book number 100, 387. Let us sing. Have you ever experienced the performance of a world-class symphony? Or maybe one that was put on by a large church choir? I don't mean listening to music through your ear, white earbuds or even using your fancy home theater system. That would be listening to music. I'm talking about experiencing it. There is a major difference between listening to a recording of Mozart and experiencing it live at a symphony hall. The notes may be the same, but our awareness of the conductor and each member of the orchestra and the distinct atmosphere they create is completely lost when you only hear a recording of the sounds. There is something about seeing the music perform before our eyes that results in a sense of wonder and exhilaration. Rather than thinking of the music as a technically satisfying product, we experience it as a profoundly incredible work of art. 
The time that comes to mind for me was when Steve and I joined some other family for a Christmas concert at one of those big churches down in Toronto. One of those churches with the high vaulted ceilings and the balcony of seating that seemed to go right up into the rafters. Famous songs and hymns I heard hundreds of times before came to life as never before as I watched this large orchestra, which also included a choir of singers, create the melodic sounds of Silent Night and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. It was amazing to pan across the stage and see each of these unique and gifted musicians playing individual notes on their instruments and singing together that resulted in this incredible symphony of sounds that filled the church. When they did Sleigh Ride and they got to the verse, the second verse when you hear, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, let's go, let's look at the show, we're riding in a wonderland of snow, I noticed their percussionist using two wooden blocks to make the clop, clop sound of horses running that you heard in the background of the song. I wouldn't have even noticed this guy hidden way in the back with his wooden blocks in hand, except that they'd featured him on the giant video screen as the camera zoomed in on him with his clop, clop sound. I never realized how important this a little additional sound in the background was to enhancing the rich texture of the melody and the lifelike experience of the song. As I thought back on that incredible performance, I got thinking about how it was a lot like the passage we hear this morning of Paul's description of different parts of the church body. The percussionist was not in a prominent position. He didn't play the violin in the first chair right next to the conductor or sing the solo parts to the start of one of my favorite hymns, Silent Night. No, he was tucked in the back, relegated to banging his two wood blocks together. Yet without him adding his unique sound to the mix, the music would have been incomplete. Similarly, understanding how spiritual gifts work melodically in a church body takes more than just listening to the harmony the members make when tuned into their gifts. It takes seeing each member of the church as an essential individual instrument, vital to the whole body. And it takes an appreciation for the work of the great conductor, the Holy Spirit, who gifts and guides each individual. Sometimes this unity has been represented officially in agreement made through the national church, but other times it is perhaps most powerfully experienced in our own local church, when many different people come together and find meaning, purpose, and support in the life of our congregation. Many different gifts, many different stories, many different journeys come together in the life of a church, and I believe we are indeed better together than any of us would be alone. Perhaps it is more fitting to say that when we build a church, we weave a beautiful but strong fabric of many colors together like an incredible symphony of music. And then we come to the passage we heard from Luke's Gospel. Some say that this was Jesus' first sermon, or at least his first important one. Many would have been present that day as he would have begun to speak. Let me first give you a little bit of the background of this day. Jesus had finally traveled back to Nazareth, his hometown. It was the Sabbath and he went to the synagogue the synagogue where he was raised for services. According to scholars, the synagogue was the central institution for everyday Jewish life. While the temple still existed, all Jews would have been expected to visit it for specific sacrificial rituals. It was the center of national Jewish religious identity. The synagogue also 
arose during the time when the Jews were in exile as a way of to gather together. Though they didn't have the altar or a priest, synagogues were laylat, with Pharisees present as the most prominent lay experts in the law. All adult men were invited to read scripture and to comment on it. Scholars tell us that the service was simple, usually reading and teaching, praying and gathering of offerings for the poor. According to one scholar, the synagogue was a school, an assembly for worship, a community center, and a place for administering justice. It is unclear as to why Jesus chose to go home to share this message. I don't imagine he expected to a kind welcome and a gentle start to his ministry. I believe he knew scripture well, and to think that that would be happening would not be the case. Maybe he went home because he knew if he could tell the truth about his mission to the people who had known him the longest, had seen him as a smart mouthed kid, an awkward teenager, as a self-serious young man, he knew that he would, he could tell the truth to anyone. If he could be brave with these people, he could face anyone. So he went home. He went to synagogue and he told them his mission, but in a unique way. When handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, he specifically sought out these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he offered this commentary. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He told them that the scripture from Isaiah is why he was there. He told them that when he heard these words from Isaiah's servant's song, that he knew what was he was called to do. While all God's people are called into this service, he knew that he had to come to share this message in a new, special way. Justice and mercy were not new to the Jewish faith. In some ways, his ministry was to be a great renewal of a rich, compassionate part of the Jewish tradition. But who he was, who he represented, was also new. Divinity lived and breathed in him in a way people had not seen. In one man, we have deep tradition, rich renewal, and a completely new incarnation of God. He was going to hold them accountable for the justice and mercy that God had called all of them to live out. No wonder they were frightened and amazed. When Jesus spoke of his mission, it seems as though he was describing his ministry as the beginning of a time of jubilee. Scholar Ruth Ann Reese reminds us that according to the book of Leviticus, Every 50th year was to be set aside as a time of liberation and restoration. While justice was always demanded, the Jubilee was the particular time in which slaves were freed and captives were restored to their own communities. Jesus oriented Jubilee as it wasn't just observed every 50 years. He wanted it to be reoriented and be observed every day and every day that followed. What would it mean for us as a faith community to really commit to Jesus' jubilee mission? What do those words of good news for the oppressed mean for those of us who feel poor and who feel, and for those of us who feel privileged? I think these words show us a, a vision of the reign of God where even the lowly can be leaders. Remember the shepherds who were the first witnesses and where the privileged use what they have to serve with others for what they need. I think back to our reading from the Apostle Paul, a letter about breaking down barriers and chains of command. He was a wise pastor who used his abilities to instruct the people gently but firmly about where their gifts come from, 
the Spirit. Paul's beautiful reflection on the unity and diversity of the church rings just as true for us today, and it is a superb in its simplicity and clarity. Now you are the body of Christ, and all are important members of it. Even a person with the most basic talent can positively affect the whole. For those of you who have been poor, dealing with poor health lately or a mishap that has laid you up, and I know there are a few of you, you know what it feels like to be a bit off balance with your day-to-day -day activities. We know from experience that the parts of our body work together and affect one another. This applies to our whole being, the emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical health. These different parts make up a person, and though they are distinct, they interact with one another in a wondrous and delicate balance. But if one part is out of sorts or is weaker than the others, it can create an imbalance. And so the other parts have to compensate or the weaker part has to get better. Gifts come in many different ways. Let me share with you a story of what I mean. Bobby was getting cold, sitting out in the backyard in the snow. Bobby didn't wear boots. He didn't like them. Anyway, he didn't have any. The thin sneakers he wore had a few holes in them, and they did a poor job of keeping his out the cold. Bobby had been back in the backyard for about an hour already, and try as he might, he could not come up with an idea for his mother's birthday gift. <sighs> he shook his head and thought, This is useless. Even if I do come up with an idea, I don't have any money to spend. Ever since his father had passed away three years ago, the family of five had lived and struggled. It wasn't because his mother didn't try or care. There just never seemed to be enough. She worked nights at the hospital, but the small wage that she was earning could only be stretched so far. What the family lacked in money and material things, they more than made up for in love and family unity. Bobby had two older and one younger sister who ran the household in their mother's absence. All three of his sisters had already made beautiful gifts for their mother. Somehow, it just wasn't fair. Here it was the day before her birthday and he had nothing. Wiping a tear from his eye, Bobby kicked the snow and started to walk down the street where the shops and stores were. It wasn't easy being six years old without a father, especially when he needed a man to talk to. Bobby walked from shop to shop looking into the decorated windows Everything seemed so beautiful and so out of reach. It was starting to get dark. and Bobby reluctantly turned to walk home when suddenly his eye caught the glimmer of the setting sun's rays reflecting off something along the curb. He reached down and discovered a shiny dime. Never before has anyone felt as wealthy as Bobby felt at that moment. As he held his newfound treasure, a warmth spread throughout his entire body, and he walked into the first store he saw. His excitement quickly turned cold when salesperson after salesperson told him he could not buy anything with only a dime. He saw a flower shop and went inside to wait in line. When the shop owner asked if he could help him, Bobby presented his dime and asked if he could buy just one flower for his mother's birthday gift. The shop owner looked at Bobby in his 10 cent offering. Then he put his hand on Bobby's shoulder and said to him, you just wait here and I'll see what I can do for you. As Bobby waited, he looked at the beautiful flowers and even though he was a boy, he could see why mothers and girls like flowers. The sound of the door closing as the last customer left jolted Bobby back to reality. All alone in the shop, Bobby began to feel alone and afraid. Suddenly, the shop owner came out and moved to the counter. There, before Bobby's eyes, lay 12 
long-stemmed red roses with leaves of green and tiny white flowers all tied together with a big silver bow. Bobby watched as the owner picked them up and placed them gently into a long white box. That will be 10 cents, young man, he said, reaching out his hand for the dime. Slowly, Bobby moved his hand to give the man his dime. Could this be true? No one else would give him a thing for his dime. Sensing the boy's reluctance, the boy, the shop owner added, I just happened to have some long stem roses on sale for tenths and a dozen. Would you like them? This time, Bobby did not hesitate. And when the man placed the long box into his hands, he knew it was true. As he returned inside, the shopkeeper's wife walked out. Who were you talking to and where are those roses you were fixing? Staring out the window and blinking the tears from his own eyes, he replied, A strange thing happened to me this morning. While I was setting up things to open the shop, I thought I heard a voice telling me to set aside a dozen of my best roses for a special gift. I wasn't sure at the time whether I had lost my mind or what, but I set them aside anyway. Then, just a few moments ago, a little boy came into the shop and wanted to buy a flower for his mother with a single dime. When I looked at him, I saw myself many years ago. I too was a poor boy with nothing to buy my mother for her birthday. A bearded man, whom I never knew, stopped me on the street and told me that he wanted to give me $10. When I saw that little boy tonight, I knew who that voice was, and I put together a dozen of my very best roses. The shop owner and his wife hugged each other tightly, and as they stepped out into the bitter cold air, they somehow didn't feel cold at all. Such a sweet story. From a long time ago, can you imagine your six-year-old walking to the stores these days? But still a really a good reminder of Jesus' hopeful message to those who feel lost and without hope. And of the Apostle Paul's, who's pointed out that we are all part of it, this and we're all in it together. I'm grateful his, for his urging to pay attention to the needs of others who are in this with us. We all have doubts. We would all rather avoid the difficult situations that come our way. But isn't it wonderful to be a part of a church community like this? Folks who will say to you, yes, you can do it. So go ahead and try. Or someone quietly tells you there is nothing to be afraid of. Or that you're not alone. Or another who simply listens and lets you talk it out. Oh yes, these are the wonderful gifts of being part of the body of Christ, both here and throughout the world. Let us pray. As, I, as we close, I'm going to invite you to join me in this prayer as you wish, using our whole bodies. First, I invite you to place your hands over your heart. Breathe in the love of God in Christ. May God's Spirit hold your heart. May God's Spirit transform us to know love. May we be a people of love and freedom. Now holding out your hands, we hold out our hands to receive with joy the goodness of your love of God in our bodies. May these hands which cook and clean and mend be hands that heal, hands that restore, hands that create. Now to our minds and our head. May our minds be filled with the goodness of the love of God. May we think and reason together. May we seek and pursue this goodness of God. We give you thanks for this. And to our lips. May laughter and kindness, may the celebration of ourselves as persons who speak words of life be ours. And the last one, 
Hug yourself with your arms. You are loved by God in this body. Breathe in God's spirit. Celebrate and dance. Pray and serve in your body. And may you be the body of Christ, and the witness to Christ together. In all things, O oh God, we give you thanks. Amen. And now let us join our voices together for our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory, Let Us Sing, from Celebration Hymnal, number 58. And now, in the name of God, who is love, who dreamed us up in the first place, to be all that we can be, may we go forth to live and love extravagantly, even wastefully, that the world God dreamed up might be all that it can be. Amen and amen.
Give me.